Welcome to the Dole Institute. I'm Bill Lacey, the director. We're delighted that you could join us tonight. Tonight we feature our second edition of Neutral Ground. Now the whole idea behind Neutral Ground is pretty simple and it's pretty easy to grasp. At a time when we as Americans seem to have trouble being uh, civil and courteous to each other, at a time when Congress seems to be, uh, our government in Washington seems to be incapable of uh, any kind of civility, uh, at a time when you can turn on the TV 24-7 and see talking hens yelling down their opponents and striving to get the clever sound bites in first. Our idea is to provide an intellectual alternative with rational arguments on each side. How about that for something that's different? Thank you. The Dole Institute becomes neutral ground, that's what we call it, where people with different points of view can come to civilly discuss controversial ideas. We've built in an audience participation component tonight. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, we passed out some index cards. There are some more available at the front if you need to go and pick one up. Uh, but uh, write your question, your name, and the town that you're from, and whether your question is for the affirmative or the negative team in tonight's uh, neutral ground. We'll collect them right before the closing statements and get in as many questions as time allows. Afterward, each side will have the opportunity to respond to each question. I want to recognize a young man who's played a critical role in putting together tonight's neutral ground. Uh, he serves as my research assistant during the year on a variety of programs. He's a graduate student at KU. He, KU. he served as our technical advisor for this program. He's also serving as our timer during the program. Uh, he helped both the advocates prepare their cases and also helped them recruit uh, their expert witnesses. Uh, but I want to recognize him for his hard, hard efforts, Andrew Hodgson. Andrew? Stand up, Andrew. Tonight's proposition is simply this. Congress should enact cap and trade legislation. The advocates will debate the extent to which global climate change is occurring and why, and whether or not a cap and trade program is an effective and economically viable solution to the problem. Now, you'll find out much more about our advocates and uh, their experts in your program tonight, and so we're not going to do detailed introductions on them. Uh, but our advocates tonight are Pedro Iragana Garay for the proposition and Ed Duckers, who will oppose it. Gentlemen, thank you very much for participating tonight. Each advocate will present their expert witnesses. Now for opening statements. First, Mr. Iragana Garay. <laughs> This evening, I will present two witnesses. They are at council table, Dietrich Earhart, who is an associate professor here at the University of Kansas and the director of the Center for Environmental Policy and Institute for Policy and Social Research. He will address issues regarding economics. My other expert, seated to his left, Johanna Fetima is a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Kansas. He has immense knowledge on issues regarding climate. Cap and trade is an essential component of our future if we wish to do something about the emissions of carbon dioxide that are causing immense concern to scientists because of its global warming impact. The Audubon Society supports cap and trade. Their position is that in practice, cap and trade is a system that creates financial incentive for emissions reductions by assigning a cost to polluting. First, an environmental regulator, like the Environmental Protection Agency, establishes a cap that limits emissions from a designated group of polluters, such as power plants, to a level lower than their current emissions. The cap and trade system do, however, exert 
pressures to polluters to reduce emissions. This encourages companies to meet or exceed their emission targets by innovative and cost-effective ways. By promoting innovation, cap-and-trade systems can help slow the pace of global warming, develop new technologies and industries, and allow for greater economic growth in the United States. The American Association for the Advancement of Science has stated that they have reaffirmed their position through their board of directors and concluded that multiple lines of scientific evidence regarding global climate and that human activities now underway are a growing threat to society. The American Association for the Advancements of Science, in a statement issued on December the 9th, 2006, stated that the evidence is clear. Global climate change caused by human activities is occurring now and is growing as a threat to our society. The National Academy of Sciences has stated that the most comprehensive report ever created has been published, an 860-page report in which, without any question, it has been established that human activity in the production of CO2 in the atmosphere is directly responsible for at least part of the global warming process. Sadly, ladies and gentlemen, not all those that speak about the issue rely on legitimate science. And the unfortunate fact is that a great deal of misinformation has been placed into the American public. Tonight, with the help of these two experts, we will demonstrate to you that global warming is an issue of great importance to us locally, nationally, and globally, and that it must be addressed before it is too late. Thank you very much. Mr. Duckers, you have your opening statement, please. Mr. Lacey, counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, I have a business proposition for you this evening. I read a study recently that says if you live in Kansas for your entire life, the odds that you will suffer at least material property damage from a tornado-inducing storm is 1 in 2,500. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is I have a program that can eliminate that risk, and the even better news is that program will cost you nothing. Eliminate all risk, cost you nothing. When the sirens go off and your neighbors go running to the southwest corner of their basement, you can stay on your couch sipping a latte and watching Mad Men, and it will cost you nothing. Now, who here would like to sign up for that? Or let me rephrase the question, is there anyone here who would not sign up? for that program? I thought not. Well, when Al Gore and Henry Waxman, President Obama, and the other high priests of the Church of Global Warming speak to you about cap and trade, that's what they're selling you. We know the risk, we can eliminate it all, and it will cost you absolutely nothing. And if that were the reality of cap and trade, you might well ask, what am I doing here this evening? And that would be a very fair question. Because I learned a long time ago, you can't argue against a free lunch. But I also learned a long time ago that there is no such thing as a free lunch. So I want to vary my business proposition to reflect reality just a little bit. I, in fact, don't have any idea what the risk is that you're going to be hit by a tornado. The data are too sketchy and incomplete. 
the science is too young, and there are far too many variables about which we know far too little. Oh, sure, I can make assumptions and assumptions upon those assumptions and put them into a computer model and generate a number, but at the end of the day, that's little more than a guess based on speculation and surmise. I also don't have any idea whether my program will work to reduce that risk. In fact, the odds are overwhelming that it will have absolutely no impact. And I don't know what my program is going to cost, but I do know two things. I know it's going to cost something, possibly quite a lot. And I know that no matter how I try to dress it up, you're going to pay for it. So that's the program. I don't know what the risk is. I don't know whether my program does any good. I know it's going to cost something. I don't know what it is, but probably a lot, and I know you're going to pay for it. Anybody want to sign up for that program? One hand back here. See me after the show, sir. I have some beachfront property in Wyoming you might also be interested in. <laughs> well, now you might well ask what my dear friend, Mr. Aragonagarai, is doing here this evening, because that is the reality of global warming and cap and trade. The evidence in this case this evening will show that the record as to whether global warming is occurring at all is entirely unsettled. You will hear from Professor Lee Gerhardt, senior professor emeritus at the University of Kansas Department of Geology, and he will tell you that what you're seeing now are computer models that are making assumptions that are unproven when the data, the facts, are at odds with those computer models. And you will also hear evidence about the massive scientific fraud that has been un going on under the auspices of the United Nations and the scientists that Mr. Aragonagare referenced. In fact, the Wall Street Journal's front page story today referenced the 866 page definitive report that he cited to you saying that they're going to have to fundamentally reform those processes because they're playing down the contrary scientific evidence. You also will hear from John McKenzie. John is one of the preeminent energy lawyers in the United States, representing both renewable energy companies and traditional companies. And he's going to tell you three things. He's going to tell you, number one, after telling you about what cap and trade is all about, that even if we enacted and hit all of the targets, it's going to have no effect whatsoever on the projections of global warming. We are too small a piece of the pie. It's going to do nothing. Number two, he's going to tell you that it's impossible to ever hit those targets, and the European attempts to do that have failed miserably, as have the efforts on the West Coast. And number three, he's going to tell you that the whole purpose of cap and trade, it's a blunt instrument of taxation. It's nothing sophisticated, nothing elegant. It's designed to jack up the price of certain costs of electricity, and you're going to pay for it. And at the end of the evidence, I'll be back to ask that you say no to, tap, to, to cap and trade, just as you said no to my revised business proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duckers. Uh, now for the affirmative case, Mr. Iroganagarai. Professor Arnhardt to the stand. May it please the court, sir, counsel. Would you please state your name and occupation? My name is Dietrich Earnhardt. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Kansas. Professor Earnhardt, what are the available uh, policy options for controlling uh, CO2 emissions? In addition to a cap and trade program, there's other policy options that have been analyzed by economists and other scientists. The most prominent would be a pollution charge. It's very similar to a dumping fee. Just like when you would go to the landfill, you'd actually be charged a fee. Here, you'd actually be dumping into the atmosphere. You'd be charged a tipping fee. There's also design standards, which many of you are probably familiar with. Anybody who has a computer probably has an Energy Star label on it. That's actually a design standard as a way of actually reducing electricity use of a computer relative to an older model. Similar would be uh, for a refrigerator. You frequently see Energy Star labels on refrigerators. There's also a policy option of having a portfolio standard that's required. So Congress actually has tried to promote the use of biofuels through that particular policy option. And the last could actually be a really standard approach that's been used since 1970 through the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act, where rather than having a cap and then allowing trade, you simply place small caps on individual polluters 
without trading. That's been, like I said, that, that's been prominently used around the world. Dr. Earnhardt, would you describe for us what cap and trade is? The name of cap and trade is actually rather apt. I mean, you place a cap on all the possible pollution that would be emitted within the United States within a given year. That particular cap or target could be selected through a variety of means. Once you actually have that cap, then you actually you want to establish property rights so that each ton of carbon dioxide would have a permit or property right attached to it. Those property rights would then be allocated through some means to all the polluters that were actually be identified in that program. Um, there generally is one ton per permit. So every ton of carbon dioxide that's generated, there has to be a permit that actually tags that. And once those permits are actually allocated, frequently they're allocated through auction, uh, through sale, or just allocated freely. It's referred to as grandfathering. So the, the uh, existing set of polluting facilities would be grandfathered in by granting them property rights so that they could continue producing. Um, once those permits are distributed initially, then that's when the trading begins. So that anybody who feels it's really difficult for them to actually control their carbon dioxide emissions, they could simply buy more permits. They could go into a market. Actually, right now, there's actually an existing program that you can go to the Chicago Board of Trade and buy a permit to emit sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. So actually, many of these facilities that would be embedded within a cap and trade program for greenhouse gas emissions have already been experiencing a cap and trade for the past 25, 20, 15 years. Um, so once, so any facility that feels they need more permits can simply buy more. Those who actually are really good, very effective at reducing their emissions, they'd actually, or pollution, they'd actually have extra permits that they could actually sell. So it's not just a punishment to those who struggle. It's actually an incentive for those to do better. Those who can do it, do it well. Professor Earnhardt, of the various options available, do you have a preference as to which would be the most effective? The cap and trade, as I mentioned, has already been utilized. I might actually promulgated and promoted by George Herbert Walker Bush back in 1990, part of the Clean Air Act amendments. So our Republican administration has already promoted the use of this tool for reducing sulfur dioxide emissions. That particular program has been wildly successful. Dramatic reductions in acid rain, actually as it flows from the Midwest, mostly to the East Coast. So we already have experimented with this program and it's succeeded very well. Um, it certainly has strong advantages. It's an incentive-based approach. It actually allows each facility to tailor make their own approach to controlling their pollution. There's nothing that's required. There's no strong arm regulation that's imposed by any government entity. All the only thing that comes is from the from the regulator, from the government, would simply be the notion that there is a property right attached to using the atmosphere. And that just like with the purchase of any other material that is used for production, just like the same way we purchase um, tires for a car or purchase chairs for what you're sitting on right now, there'd actually be a purchase of the use of the atmosphere. So it's, it's nicely incentive-based, something that's familiar to all businesses. Um, it actually allows them to innovate over time. They can actually find cheaper, better methods over time. So it's, it's consistent with our notion of technological advancement that we'd like to champion. Uh, it also allows um, the application of that policy to broadly work its way through society. So it's not simply that coal-fired power plants in Kansas would be stuck with this. That's not the full scope of it. What it does is it sends a signal to all of us, to society, that we are generating carbon dioxide. That's a problem. And we all are, are part of the solution, that we can find better alternative ways of uh, dealing with that. So it could honestly be just behavioral changes that we should be doing anyway. I mean, anybody who's ever bought a fluorescent, compact fluorescent light bulb can appreciate that there are changes that we can make. Also, there's behavioral changes um, that would be something, honestly, that would actually benefit us. I mean, there's, a, there's an obesity epide epidemic in our society. We all could benefit by actually finding ways that are alternative to getting in our car. And eating, I might add, 30, 40 
percent of our caloric intake. No further questions, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Duckers, your cross-examination. In your testimony that you need to, we need to send a signal through cap and trade to everyone, you're referring to people in the audience, the consumers, correct? Including myself and you, yeah. yes. And you send that signal by raising the price they pay for energy, correct? That is a very effective way of sending a signal. And yes. that's what cap and trade does, is it raises prices to consumers so that they'll use less, correct? Similar to be true for any product that is scarce. Okay, I just want to make sure we understand what we're talking about. We're talking about a carbon tax that will be paid by consumers, correct? It's not a tax, it's a cap and trade. Yeah, but tax, is, tax is a different policy tool, as I mentioned in my opening. Okay. But if I pay a higher price, how is that different than a tax, Professor? A tax would actually be administered by the government. Here it's actually based on the market transaction. If somebody takes $100 out of my pocket, do I care whether it's the federal government or my local utility? Why would I care? Why would you care? Um, I, I'm, why would you care? Yeah, or why, why would, would anybody care? Why would anybody care? Um, for the purposes of actually their budget, not much. But I will say the cap and trade actually generates revenues that can be recycled through the government. So the beauty of cap oh, and so trade... Oh, so it's an income redistribution program. You take $100 no, out of my pocket through cap and trade and you give it to someone else? No, it's an income tax lowering mechanism. That is, the government would no longer need to actually tax our income, which is actually good, and actually in the process actually raise, raise revenues through other means. What's it going to cost consumers to enact a cap and trade proposal? It depends upon the cap and trade proposal. I want to ask you about a document it's recently produced pursuant to a Freedom of Information Act request by the Obama administration. It's from their transition team, written by Judson Jaffe at the Department of Treasury. And he says about cap and trade, the administration's proposal, while such a program can yield environmental benefits that justify its costs, it will raise energy prices and impose annual costs on the order of and then about a line and a half is blanked out dollars. Now, the Obama administration redacted the cost of their cost cap and trade proposal. Professor, you would agree with me if that was a happy number for them, they wouldn't have redacted it. I would agree that they probably would have, if it's a happy number, sure, they would not have right. redacted it. And so since they that. redacted it, it tells you that the cost of cap and trade for consumers in the Obama administration's mind is high enough that they want to hide it by redacting it from a document produced by a Freedom of Information Act request? Not getting, I'm not necessarily able to get inside the minds of the people who actually redacted that. I would say the costs certainly are outweighed by the benefits of the program. What are the benefits? The How much are we going to reduce the global temperature in 2100 if we enact a cap and trade proposal in the United States? In some ways, the benefits don't even require the notion of climate change being a problem. Many of the problems associated with electricity, we, can, we should already be addressing. Those issues that I spoke of with sulfur dioxide or any particulate matter, those are already problems. Also, from a consumer's perspective, Professor, what's the cost-benefit analysis? I'm speaking from a societal standpoint. Consumers would actually benefit from actually having a more stable climate. They would benefit from actually having cleaner air. All right. And they want to pay a higher price for that. The price is a great mechanism for actually inducing us to do things differently. No argument there, Professor, none whatsoever. Just one last question for you. Is it, is it not a fact that the biggest proponent of cap and trade after Kyoto in 1997 was Enron Corporation? Because those boys just couldn't wait to get their hands on another trading mechanism that they could game with complex derivatives? Certainly, I mean, Wall Street in general has actually embraced cap and trade. I'm they, just asking about Enron. Isn't Enron fact? and the other Wall Street fact. It is a fact that actually the regulated community, including Enron, would, would, has actually endorsed cap and trade just for the purposes of resolving the uncertainty in the regulatory policy realm. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Mr. Iragana Garai. I call. Dr. Fetima to the stand. Dr. Fetima, does human activity create carbon dioxide? 
Yes. And can you tell us whether or not that carbon dioxide has an impact on climate? Yes, it does. Um, carbon dioxide has a set of radiative properties, which means it absorbs or emits radiation. So knowing the radiative properties of carbon dioxide, first found in 1856, and its increasing concentration in the atmosphere, which we can measure directly and have, and it's increased about 30 to 35 percent over the level that it was at in about 1870 or so. Um, and knowing and understanding the laws of physics, particularly the Stefan Boltzmann law, which regulates how things absorb and emit radiation, we know from basic physics, basic physical laws, that if you add more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it will change the way energy flows through the Earth system, how it comes from the sun and has to go back out. If we somehow change those flows to make it so that the, maybe the solar amount of energy stays the same, but carbon dioxide stops more energy from going out, that means more energy is coming in than out, and we will get warmer. That comes from basic Stefan Boltzmann law. That's a law of physics, not a theory, not a hypothesis, a law. That means it doesn't fail. So given that, scientists, if I put 100 climate scientists up here who actually work on climate specifically and these physical laws, et cetera, if I put 100 scientists up here and you ask them that question, 98 would step forward and say yes. One would say, I'm not sure. And one would say, I don't think so. If I did that to the public, 45 of you would step forward and say, yes, we believe it. And the rest of you wouldn't. Okay, that's the gap we have between the scientific community who really studies this and understands the physics and the populace. How do we communicate that gap? So based on the knowledge that we have about this science, and a scientist would argue this is not a debate at this point in terms of CO2 affecting the energy balance. What we might debate or talk about is the uncertainty that comes about because of that change. The Earth will respond to that change one way or the other. It will do something. One thing it will do is it warm up the atmosphere a little bit. That means a bit more so moisture can be held by the atmosphere. Water vapor is the biggest greenhouse gas. Adding a little bit of that adds more greenhouse warming, and therefore we get a positive feedback effect, meaning additive feedback effect. From those studies and a number of other things that I don't have time to go into, we know that on average the Earth is expected to warm about 3 degrees Celsius given the current path of emissions that we have. And actually, those emissions are lower than we are currently on. Uh, that's 6 to 7 degrees Fahrenheit. For Kansas, it'll be 8 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, we think. Okay? There are uncertainties here, yes, because there are these feedbacks. And we don't know all of them exactly. There are uncertainties in how big they will be. And there is uncertainty that comes about because of the inherent instability within the system. We have what we call interannual variability, or climate, or weather is different from year to year. We might have an El Nino effect. We might have a volcano erupt. We know that a volcano will cool the Earth for a while. Okay? So we have other things going on that causes the signal not to be exactly the same as what the CO2 signal might be. We don't expect an exact correlation. We expect an average change that follows what CO2 dictates will happen in this instance. What we do know, based on our physical understanding of the process, not just observations, observations bear this out though, is that the poles should get warmer than the equator. That means that the temperature gradient between the cold and the warm in the Earth is going to change. And based on Ohm's law, we know that the potential for energy is going to be reduced, then the flow will change. If the flow is reduced, for example, over Kansas of the atmosphere, that means that fronts might come through a little less frequently, which means the dry period between storms will increase. Also, though, because the atmosphere will be warmer, there will be more water vapor in the air, we may get more intense rainfall events. So that's one of the things that we expect to have happen, specifically for this region. I thought the interesting statement was just made um, about climate or the weather over here. And one of the interesting things is that computer, he just said something like computer models say that our climate is changing. Computer models confirm or give us the theory for knowing why it is changing. 
They don't tell us why, okay? The observations tell us that it is. The computer models just project how it might happen or why it happened. Okay, that's the difference between the theory and the data that we need to think about. Uh, I would also argue that the other thing that we have to think about, and this is a big uncertainty in this whole question, is that what affects you in terms of your daily life is not the average climate. You all know what your average climate is. What affects you is the extreme events. Ask the Russians, ask the Pakistanis, ask a whole bunch of people around this world this year. Okay, that one event is what gets you, the Dust Bowl or something else. With we can understand the average change in the climate, but we also have to understand the variability, and the variability is expected to go up. And so the risks lie primarily along, amongst that variability, that extreme event that might change over time. Doctor, are there certain measurements that we are familiar with by which you, as a scientist, can gauge the rate of global warming? I think that I should explain here very briefly that when we create a model of understanding of how this works, and this is the reason we create a model, it's a theory of how the system works. We can look and say the temperature is increasing, and in fact it is increasing. There's all the evidence that the global temperature has increased about 0.8, 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit in the last century. Most of us think only of temperature as the measure for change, but actually to do this right you have to think about other variables. If it is CO2 that is causing the climate to change, we expect a certain outcome. And I'm going to talk about those in a second. If the solar activity were to change, we would expect a different outcome. If you increase solar radiation, the entire atmosphere would warm up. If it's CO2 that's changing, then it really or occupies mostly the lower atmosphere, and the change would expect it to be happen there. So we'd expect the troposphere, the lowest layer, to actually warm up. We would expect the higher layers above there to cool off. We would expect the troposphere, uh, sorry, the thermosphere at the top of the atmosphere to shrink. All of those things have been observed. For evidence that, in fact, we are adding CO2 to the atmosphere, we can take a measurement of CO2, but we also have noted that oxygen is going down in our atmosphere on average. Because when you burn carbon, you're using oxygen to oxidize it and create CO2. Both of those things are working together. We can tell geologic carbon. So fossil fuels from modern day carbon through isotope analysis. We know that those isotopes are showing up in our coral reefs. They're showing up in, um, sorry, I have to look up my notes here for just a second. Um, they're showing up in the atmosphere and the carbon there. So we know, we can put a signature on where the carbon comes from and we know that we're increasing this carbon. So beyond that, we are measuring less of the radiation that carbon dioxide specifically absorbs and nothing else coming out of the Earth system, which tells us that carbon dioxide is changing the energy balance of the Earth. Okay? Um, and we can measure the increased heat coming from the atmosphere because of carbon absorbing it and water vapor that is being sent back to the Earth. These are all separate pieces of evidence that probably most of you have never thought about. But when we add all of these pieces together, we can confirm the fingerprint, as we like to call it in climate, that comes with warming due to changes in carbon dioxide. Doctor, is there historic measure, are there historic measurements that we can look at to compare, for example, the amount of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere in the past versus what it is today and correlate that to man-generated carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Yes, there are actually, and uh, I mean, there, there, are num there are what we call proxy records, okay? Um, these are records that indicate caters of climate change. Um, ice sheets trap air bubbles, and those air bubbles can be used to actually analyze what the atmosphere looked like uh, in the past, all the way back about 800,000 years, or 740,000 years, sorry. Uh, and we know from that that the maximum amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in that entire period, so nearly a million years, is roughly 300 and, uh, let me think, 10 parts per million maximum. At the end of the Industrial Revolution, there were about 270 parts per million. At the beginning of human civilization, where we domesticated plants and animals, it was about 30 parts per million higher. So 
From the Industrial Revolution to the birth of my grandfather in 1901, there was another 20 parts per million increase. Remember that 20 in 250 years. By the time I was born in 1959, there were about 30 more parts per million of carbon dioxide in 50 years. In 2005, when some of the figures that I initially pulled out, we had another, we were at 370 parts per million. We're now at 385. In the last five years, we roughly put as much carbon into the atmosphere as we did in the entire first half of this century and since industrialization. That's an unprecedented rapid rate of increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. We are poking the bear with the stick. We just don't know yet exactly what will happen. But we have a really good idea because we understand the physics. Thank you, sir. No further questions. Mr. Duckers, your cross-examination. Professor. You spoke to us about extreme weather events yep. uh, being something we should be concerned about. What's the correct temperature to minimize extreme weather events? There is no such thing. What's the correct temperature for the climate today? There is. The, how do you mean? I, I don't know. I well, mean, are we I, better off? It, then it's a nonsensical question. I don't understand your question, I guess. Well, I'm trying to figure out what we're, what we're worrying about here, Professor. Well, would you uh, want to know the average U.S. temperature or the global temperature? Global. Is it better to, was it better in 2004 and 1998? Well, not better in either. They were different. They were just different. Yeah. So di change is just change. Difference is just difference. Neither, one is not better than the other, right? Um, I would disagree with that. All right. Well, let me ask you this then, Professor. Uh, you, you spoke about um, water vapor being the ultimate greenhouse gas, correct? Correct. And, the, and as I understand it, the models that, that predict the, the rather dramatic increases in temperature are premised on a belief that there will be positive feedback from the CO2 that will increase water vapor, and that's what really sends the temperature skyrocketing, correct? I wouldn't call it skyrocketing. But going up. It's going up, and water vapor will add more than the carbon dioxide alone. You know who Martin Rees is, don't you? He's the president of the Royal Society. Okay. And you know Ralph J. Cicerone, president of the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, don't you? Mm -hmm. Let me read you a letter they sent to the Financial Times in, Ap in, in April where they're addressing the question of whether there is scientific certainty regarding positive feedback. They write, uncertainties in the future rate of this rise stemming largely from the feedback effects on water vapor and clouds are topics of current research. Do you agree with that? Yes. You also mentioned that... I would like to add to that. That does not mean that it doesn't exist. No, but it means they don't know the answer. They're researching it, right? They know that there is a positive effect. They don't know quite how big it is, so it could be one or two degrees Celsius. Does it matter if it's one or two? Maybe, maybe not. Right. But it is one or two. It's not minus one or minus two. Okay. You mentioned the poles um, heating quicker than the equator. Did I hear that correctly? Correct. Um, and, and there's been quite a bit published recently about what's been going on in the Arctic, correct? Correct. Um, I, I want to read you um, a, a, a Commerce Committee report that was in the Washington Post, see if you agree if it describes what's going on in the, uh, in the Arctic. Just some excerpts. It says, the Arctic Ocean is warming up. Icebergs are growing scarcer, and in some places, the seals are finding the water too hot. Reports all point to a radical change in climate conditions and hitherto unheard of temperatures in the Arctic zone. Great masses of ice have been replaced by moraines of earth and stones, while at many points, well-known glaciers have entirely disappeared. Is that consistent with what the science is finding today? Yes. And Were you aware that that article was published in the Washington Post on November 2nd, 1922? I'm sure it was happening then too, yes. But were you aware that a similar article was published in the Post in 1957 after the ice reformed? Saying the opposite? Or no, saying, saying that the ice had reformed and it was I was, was not aware again. of that, no. And I believe your testimony was that CO2 increased rather radically between 1922 and 1957, correct? Say again, 1922 and 1957? Yes. Well, right. I wouldn't say it was increasing much more slowly than today. Let me ask you this, Professor. Is it the practice of science to ignore data that's inconsistent with the hypothesis? No, it shouldn't be. You know who Phil Jones is, don't you? Yes, I do. He's director of the Climate Research Institute at East Anglia University in Great Britain. Correct. 
Let me read you a 2005 email he wrote. It says, the scientific community would come down on me in no uncertain terms if I said the world had cooled from 1998. Okay, it has, but it's only seven years of data and it isn't st statistically significant. Are you familiar with that email? No. All right. Why would the scientific community come down in no uncertain terms on Mr. Jones for speaking the truth? Because a seven-year record is not a climatological record. Office. In order to, uh, hang on, let me finish, please. <laughs> Sorry. In order to describe climate, which is an average of weather, you need at least a significant period of time to average that weather over. So does that mean right? you can't state the fact that it's gone down for the last seven years? Oh, you can say that. Well, and, and, and why would the scientific community come down on him for saying that? I don't know. I don't know what his argument was there. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor. We appreciate your testimony. Okay, we'll switch gears. Mr. Duckers, it's time for you to present your case against cap and trade. Your Honor, may it please the court, I would call Professor Lee Gerhardt to the stand. Good evening, Professor Gerhardt. Good evening. Could you please state your education and professional background in summary fashion for the members of the audience? Uh, three degrees in geology, the last two at here at KU. Uh, I, in honesty, I worked for the oil business for three and a half years out of the last 46. I've been tenured in four different academic institutions, the last one being the Getty Professor of Geological Engineering at the Colorado School of Mines. I've also been the state geologist of two states. I was your state geologist for 13 years and director of the Kansas Geological Survey. I've been working in uh, environmental policy for most of the last 25 years and I got involved in climate change specifically in part because of a meteorological background that I received after my baccalaureate degree and as a member of, uh, of President Reagan's appointment to the National Advisory Committee on Oceans and Atmosphere. Uh, I got into the current debate about 1990 when after the 1988 uh, testimony to Congress by James Hansen raised the issue of whether or not man-made carbon dioxide will contribute to major climate change. Uh, as a geologist and understanding something about the immensity of the Earth's dynamic systems, uh, I thought that needed some scrutiny. I went into the literature in 1990. I finally published my first paper on this, a peer-reviewed paper, incidentally, uh, in 1996, and I have been active in publication since that time. Right. I have a book and a couple of other papers. The book is in its center, second printing. Professor Gerhardt, are, you're familiar with the claim that man-made CO2 emissions are causing the Earth's climate to warm at an, at an alarming rate, are you not? I am quite familiar with it. All right, and do you have an opinion as to whether that uh, is true? I cannot ascertain the truth of that statement. Can you tell us why you cannot ascertain the truth of that statement? If you look at the source of, first off, the theory of greenhouse gases to start with. This theory was advanced in about 1896 by uh, Arrhenius, and in, in 1906, he made the argument that CO2 not only acted as a greenhouse gas, but it had limits on its activity. That is, its effectiveness as a gas decreases with increasing concentration logarithmically. In other words, it's a very, very steep drop-off curve. Uh, that theory was challenged in 1909 by a series of experiments by a man called Wood. I've not been able to replicate the paper, but I have read the reviews and, and reproduction of that. Uh, since that time, it's become quite clear. Of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, water vapor is approximately 95% of the effect of greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide and all other gases are about the other, are the other 5%. Of that, the human contribution to the greenhouse effect is about 0.28%. Uh, so that the amount of human impact 
on the total greenhouse budget is quite small. Let me ask you this, Professor. Uh, the last witness testified that temperature has increased over the last century by approximately 0 0.8 degrees centigrade. Is that uh, unique or, uh, or a particularly rapid rate of temperature change? No, that's actually a relatively small rate. Uh, the greatest, you know, the, amount, the rate of ch temperature change, and this is something I'm in current research on uh, and writing a paper about, using ice core data, uh, the run-up to the medieval warm event of approximately a thousand years ago, uh, the rate of change was about 1.55 degrees C per hundred years. And some very short things, like about 500 to 600 years ago, we saw a rate change of about uh, 2.21 degrees C per hundred years. The, the, the calculation I make is our rate right now is about 0.61 degrees C per hundred years, and that's well within normal limits and uh, nothing to that would out of the ordinary at all. Okay. The last witness also testified that if you brought 100 scientists in, 98 of them would agree with his position. This is consistent with what we're told consistently, that there is a scientific consensus that man-made global warming is real and that the IPCC has conclusively proved that. How do you respond to those assertions? Uh, consensus has no place in science. It's not a matter of votes. As Michael Crichton said, uh, the work of science is not by consensus. The work of one scientist with good data to formulate a uh, replicatable uh, and verifiable theory is all that's necessary to drive science. Are you familiar, uh, Professor, with something that's come to be known in the media as climate gate? Unfortunately, I am. It's right. been a disaster for science reputation globally. Can you tell the audience what ClimateGate is and what it has told you? Uh, the climate Gate was the release of a uh, several thousand emails from the East Anglia uh, Climate Center, referred to earlier in, in testimony. Okay. Those, uh, are, those are from advocates of the proposition that man is causing global warming. Uh, the emails themselves were among a lot of different people, but they included almost all of the major group of people who are advocating for the concept that humans cause climate to change. Uh, some of those, well, they're, they're devastating in my book because they showed several people were hiding data. They showed that people involved in this were doing their very best to keep contrary opinions from reaching publication. This is not how science is done. Science is done by advancing a concept, a theory, and then having it tested and verified. And if it fails the test, you go back to the drawing board. What we're dealing with here seems to be a group of folks who are doing their very best to avoid the testing of the hypothesis. Thank you very much, Professor. Mr. Uraganagare, time for your cross-examination. Professor Gebhardt, you would agree with me, would you not, that what the tobacco industry did in manufacturing false science to continue to encourage Americans to smoke cigarettes was unethical, correct? That's what I hear. I've never looked into that. So as you sit there today, you have no knowledge about what Big Tobacco did in their campaign to continue poisoning young American boys and girls? Uh, only whatever in the media. Are you familiar with the efforts by Exxon Corporation and other large corporations in forming a variety of different organizations to generate the belief that global uh, climate change is not man-created? Uh, I don't know that I heard it exactly that way, sir. Uh, Let me I do you. know that Exxon did not buy into a, the anthropogenic global warming movement, and it was quite vocal, and it supported efforts to show data that conflicted with that theory. You are one of those experts that has been, in essence, used by the, by the uh, oil industry? Absolutely not. Sir, As a matter are you of fact, not, I have turned down in, money from the oil industry to support my research. Are you not, in fact, an allied expert for a Canadian group called the Natural Resource Stewards Project? 
I'm, yes or no, sir? I, far as I know, it sounds familiar, but I'm not it, sure about You don't even is. know if you're one of their allied experts listed in their uh, website? I'm a member of a number of different groups. And uh, do you know who funds that organization? It, it's not material to me because I receive no funding. I didn't ask you if you receive funding. I'm asking you, do you know who funds that organization? No, I do not. Are you aware of the fact that they have refused consistently to let people know where their funding comes from? I am not aware of that. Are you, sir, uh, of the opinion then that anthropogenic uh, uh, emissions of carbon dioxide are not a relevant factor as far as global warming? They are a very minor factor. I can give you testimony about a uh, human impact on climate if you wish to hear it. Uh, because during World War II, from about 1941 to about 1958, solar uh, energy was increasing, but global temperature appeared to go down. And I attribute that to be an anthropogenic climate uh, control, but that was the result of World War II fire bombings and surface testing of atomic bombs. And when all that ceased, then the solar and temperature curves began to merge again. You're familiar, are you not, with the global climate science team? The what? The global climate science team. Science what? Team. S I'm sorry. I'm, G C S T. Uh, the global climate. You've science never heard of them? I, I'm, 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 I have a hard time hearing, and that last word is not coming team. through to me. Team. Team, Professor. Team. As in the Jayhawks are a team? Team? I don't okay. want okay. to associate the Jayhawks yeah. with these guys. No. <laughs> Fair enough, counsel. Thank you, sir. You are aware who they are, you not, and you know for a fact that in 1998, they outlined the strategy that was going to be used by big oil to manufacture uncertainty, just like big tobacco. Actually, I don't know that. Were you aware that the report produced by GCST which has now been made public, which was supported by Big Oil, said the following, victory will be achieved when average customers understand uncertainty in climate change and when public recognition of uncertainty becomes part of the conventional wisdom. Isn't it not the case that Big Oil is using people like you, using bad science, to continue to pollute our environment in order to make huge profits at the expense of future generations. Uh, I think that's unwarranted accusation, and I know nothing about any efforts by big oil to control or to influence anything I have written, spoken about, or believe. Are you aware of the studies, the studies regarding the uh, possible impact on, uh, so on, on Earth's uh, global climate uh, generated by scientists Solis and Hanula. Uh, this, the authors again? Solis and Habila. No. Are you aware of the fact that those particular studies generated by those two scientists have been used by Exxon and other big oil corporations to, in essence, attempt to confuse the public regarding global warming? Uh, no, I'm not aware of that. Do you I mean, You keep harping on uh, big oil, but I'm not part of that. Sir, you are, in fact, involved with a uh, lobbying group from Canada that does uh, receive funding from big oil, aren't you? I'm not involved with a lobbying group. I have signed on to statements which I believe in, which have gone to the government officials in that thing. But I am not part of that group. What is the current amount in parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Uh, last I saw it was about 388 parts per million. And isn't, that a, isn't it a fact that that is the highest amount in the atmosphere for the last 800,000 years? Uh, I can't testify to 800,000, but if you want to go to 4 million, the answer is it isn't even close. Well, but four million years ago is not what we're talking about. I, well, you know, if you go back to uh, 500 million years ago, we've got a big glacial episode going on, and we've got carbon dioxide at 8,000 parts per million. 
Well, but we know in science why that occurred as a result of tectonic plate movement. When those particular plates were sliding into one another, it released a huge amount of carbon dioxide, but there were no humans around at the time, correct? Uh, well, actually, we don't know that. That's a misstatement, I would think, because the composition of the primeval atmosphere probably had a huge amount of CO2 in it, a lot of which has been taken up by uh, organics and uh, the growth of the fact we have a plant-dominated planet. In fact, you are aware of the theory of tectonic plate movement, are you not? Uh, as a matter of fact, I have made the argument that the cause of the Pleistocene glacial stages is, in fact, a uh, result of plate movement. And you are aware of the fact that as India was sliding into the Himalayas, what occurred as far as carbon dioxide? Uh, as India was going into the Himalaya, uh, if you go back, you can look in the, if you're talking the early Pennsylvanian or whether you're talking the Cenozoic, uh, in the uh, Cretaceous as that went on, carbon dioxide went up and then it went down to the Pleistocene. Regardless of whether it's gone up or down, we as human beings need to be concerned about today, correct? Uh, we need to put it in an appropriate historical context. And we need to put it in a context that matches the scientific knowledge and information that we have, correct? It needs to be certainly adjudicated on the basis of the data, not necessarily the models. And the model is not intended to generate data. The models help us understand what, in fact, is available, correct? Uh, only if you can examine the assumptions behind the model. And in order to do that, one must be first objective. That's correct. One must be knowledgeable. That's correct. And one must not be subservient to industry, correct? And that's correct. No further questions. Thank you very much, Professor. Mr. Duckers? Call John McKinsey to the stand. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mr. McKenzie, could you please briefly describe your educational and professional background for the members of the audience? I'm a former nuclear power plant operator. Uh, I served in the Navy on submarines operating nuclear power plants uh, and a graduate of the, of the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. Then I studied economics and law. And today, and for my entire career as a lawyer, I've, I've worked in the energy industry dealing with energy policy and energy matters and, and the implementation of these energy policies and ideas to the in electrical, particularly the electricity sector. And cap and trade that we're discussing tonight is something that primarily impacts the generation of electricity, correct? That's correct. Um, in the United States... Uh, it, let me just ask one thing to clear up from the last examination. Do we burn crude oil to generate electricity in the United States? Almost none. It, it, it registers uh, less than 1% of our electricity, and it's mostly a product of backup generators and Alaska in the bush country where they still use combustion engine generators okay. to make Can electricity. Can you explain how we do generate electricity in this company, what would be affected by cap and trade since it's not big oil, and what the uh, cost of different production methods are and what the emissions profile is? as simply and concisely as you can. Uh, the, the electricity industry, more than anything, to, to really understand it, you have to understand that it has to produce electricity in real time. There's no storage. And uh, at the same time, demand cycles up and down on a daily basis, and peak demand for each day cycles up and down over the course of a year. So the electricity industry has evolved essentially two types, and recently we've added a third type of generating facility. We have baseload facilities that are highly efficient, and so we want to run them all the time. And then we have peaker facilities, which are less efficient, and we use those to respond to changes in demand. In the last, say, 20 to 30 years, maybe 40, we've been adding a new component, renewable electricity, which uh, has a particular characteristic that we can't for most renewable electricity directly control when it's gonna produce. And so peakers have, have become another role in addition to making up for changes in daily demand, they also now are increasingly being asked to serve a role to make up for a drop in renewable electricity. Overall in the United States, we get about half of our electricity from coal. The other half is uh, about equal shares of, of nuclear power electricity, hydropower electricity, and the combustion of natural gas. 
Generally speaking, natural gas is going up as a source of, of fuel for electricity in the United States, and coal is, is working its way down. And renewable energy is, is a small little piece of the pie that's been gradually, very slowly getting larger. The other thing to understand is that uh, the varying types and sources of, of electricity has a, a different carbon footprint. And uh, our predominant source, coal, coal power plants, have the largest carbon footprint, often uh, reaching a, a rating, we, we often use a number of a megawatt hour to, to measure uh, electrical energy produced, and a coal plant can be more than 2,000 pounds of carbon dioxide per megawatt hour. Contrast that with a, a highly efficient combustion gas turbine facility, and they can get down as low as 700 pounds, so much more or less than half. Renewable energy we generally think of as having almost no uh, carbon footprint, though there is uh, some debate increasing as the penetration of renewable electricity in our grid that the standby uh, emissions for facilities that have to be ready to ramp up when renewable energy goes down is, uh, is something that has to be accounted for in renewable energy, but it still should be fairly close to zero for most forms of renewable energy. What, and then the, finally, to really understand, the, the cost of uh, the, our makeup today, 50 percent coal, is simply because coal has been our cheapest source of electricity. Uh, the problem is, that, and it's one of the facts that our electricity industry is responsible for such a large amount of our carbon production, is the simple fact that it's, uh, our carbon sources of energy have been our cheapest. On the other hand, renewable energy, though having a very low carbon footprint, has the highest costs, or close to the highest costs, that we may face in terms of the source of electricity. So they don't go hand in hand, and that presents one problem for us. What, can you give us an order of magnitude what a megawatt hour of a coal plant costs versus a, a solar or wind megawatt hour? A, uh, a very efficient megawatt hour from a coal plant or a combined cycle gas turbine plant can be down as low as, say, 3 to $4 for a megawatt hour. Uh, solar facilities have been coming down. There's the, the latest reported numbers are probably around $18, and there's still plenty being quoted at more than $20 per megawatt hour. Okay. Um, can you explain how a cap-and-trade program would work in terms of changing the distribution of electrical generation and, what, and, and how companies would respond to that incentive? The, uh, I, probably the best example to use is the, the closest we've come to uh, enacting something, the, the Waxman-Markey bill, uh, and it is a good example of the difficulty in trying to regulate carbon dioxide emissions in the electricity sector. What it strove to do was establish a ceiling or a cap, much as uh, the advocate's expert proposed, but it, it, it would, of course, propose that on the generators, the owners of the power plants of this and at the same time, it then took all of those credits and allocated them out all over the place, uh, some of which went to the utilities that sell the electricity. A little bit would have gone to the, to the generators of electricity. And what it would have done, and this is the trade part, is it then would cause all these recipients of these, of these credits, it, they get them as gifts, they can then sell them back to the generators so that they're trading them and buying and selling them to make up for their emissions. The, the problem with this model is that we're essentially separating, and unlike the example of, say, sulfur dioxide, where we, we imposed a cap and trade on the generators, and the generators did all the trading, here, because the electricity industry is much more complicated and we have to target these efficiencies and these, these different sources of electricity, we're imposing the program on both ends of the transaction. And, and that means we have a cap and trade program that has to work back and forth through it, and that generates all sorts of problems and issues. Uh, John, do you have an opinion? Let's assume for the moment that the risk of global warming is real and that we enacted a cap-and-trade proposal with sort of draconian targets like Waxman-Markey. Do you have an opinion as to whether that would reduce the risk of global warming standing along in any appreciable manner? I do, and it, it would not. It, and one of the biggest reasons, and again, it relates to our advocate's testimony, is that to be effective, you, he used specifically the word all. You go after all of the emissions. Unfortunately, the Waxman-Markey bill is an example of our frustrations in attempting to do that, is that we're going after a small portion of it, maybe a third, maybe 40 percent of the emissions directly made in the United States. And then of that, we're imposing a program that is relying on renewable energy standards, renewable electricity standards, which we've been experimenting with and struggling with significantly in the West for almost a decade now. And then the remaining is, is in this, this program. But even if it has all the effects you want it to have on just that small piece, the electricity sector, we're leaving out there uh, untouched uh, a significant amount of emissions in the United States. And then the United States, though we have uh, the highest carbon footprint per capita 
uh, in the world for the most part, we're still only one small source and we're leaving behind two significant uh, growing sources, India and China. So the end result is it's probably something that gives us a really nice warm feeling but um, won't really have an appreciable effect. All right. um, with respect to the targets that have been kicked around in some of the cap and trade legislation, talking about reducing uh, CO2 levels basically back to the uh, per capita levels we had in the 1800 or the 19, 1800s, 1875. Uh, do you have an opinion as to whether uh, those are achievable? Are those realistic goals, or is that just more feel-good noise from the politicians? It, it it's not achievable. Uh, it, the biggest problem we have is that in in this current era, we we depend tremendously on energy, and not just in the electricity sector, but in the transportation sector, uh, and to revert back to 1850s when electricity was not even a significant, it was still being uh, developed and, and understood, is, is kind of silly. Our, our real problem and our real challenge is to figure out how to reshape the types of energy we use and to try to lower that carbon emissions if it's truly necessary. And, uh, and the idea that we're gonna make some massive reduction is just about as likely as we're gonna turn off all the lights in this building, which would be the easiest way to take us back to that era uh, when we weren't producing that much carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, do, you, do you have an opinion, uh, John, as to, as to what a cap and trade proposal would cost and who would end up paying that cost? The, the who would end up paying part is very easy because it's a pass-through. So the consumer of the electricity has to pay for those costs. And whether it happens in the immediate short run or the long term is partly a function of the, of the financial structure of the industry. The, the, the tougher question is what those costs would be. The, and, and unfortunately, as a great example, the Waxman-Markey bill has been uh, put forward as almost being a zero cost or a no cost proposition. Uh, Unfortunately, and, and when you richly even read, for instance, the CBO offices, uh, the Congressional Budget Office's numbers, you realize they were only talking about taxes and the budget uh, that would be required from the federal government, and uh, the EPA themselves acknowledged uh, a number in the hundreds of dollars per person as the cost. But even that really presents this problem, which is for us to make a notable reduction, we have to do two things we have to greatly increase the amount of renewable electricity we're depending on, which costs, let's just use $20 a megawatt hour as opposed to 3 or $4 a megawatt hour. And we have to create a, a tremendous amount of carbon sequestration programs to remove carbon, capture it, and then take it out of the atmosphere permanently. And those, of course, are not only going to cost a lot, but we really don't know how much those things are going to cost. Most of them are unproven theories and ideas. And, and so the end result is that we have a big unknown on the costs, uh, but we know that they're going to be significantly higher because with a cap and trade program, we're adding all these sorts of in inefficiencies. And as opposed to perhaps directly regulating, the most notable thing we're adding is the element of profiteering and gaming the system and all the other things that would come along, particularly with a cap and trade in the electricity sector, where we have this confusion between the utilities that make the decisions on buying electricity and the generators that are the ones that produce the electricity and emit the carbon. Thank you very much, Mr. McKenzie. Okay, Mr. Iragana Garay, um, Mr. Duckers, I allowed Mr. Duckers to ask a couple of extra questions in his cross X. Your time has almost expired, but I'm going to allow you to go two questions past your first question. Thank you, sir. Sir, I, I heard Mr. Ducker ask you whether or not Exxon um, sells oil to generate electricity. Do you recall that question? Actually, I think the question was, do we use oil to make electricity in the United States? And, and your answer was no, correct? I said not significantly. Now, are you aware of what a gigaton is? A gigaton, yes. What is a gigaton? Um, a gigaton is a 10, is, is a, is a, let's see, the easiest way to say it is probably 1 times 10 to the 12th tons. A lot of tonnage, right? Yes. Are you aware of how many gigatons of CO2, or let's make it a little easier. Are you aware of how many tons of um, CO2 Exxon products produced into our atmosphere in the year 2005? Uh, yes. How many? About one third of our overall carbon footprint, the transportation sector, which cap and trade wouldn't address. What is that number? Um, in which year? In 2005. 
in 2005, I think we probably use a number, I, I'm used to another term, which is a million metric tons, a gigatons, uh, and that should be, I would guess, about 200 million metric tons. Are you aware of the... Mi Mr. Ergana Gray, I'm sorry, your time's up. I gave you about five questions after your time expired. I thought I had five minutes. To you had nine minutes for your total cross-examination for both. A total of nine cumulative minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We are going to now give you an opportunity to pose your questions by note card. If you have a question that you've written down, if you would pass it to the center, we're going to take just a few minutes to pick those up, hopefully just a minute or two, and then we're going to pose those questions. Each side will get a chance to answer so that everybody understands about the format. Each, each uh, position had 18 minutes to present their case and nine minutes for cross-examination. Each advocate was allowed to use that cumulative time as they saw fit. I allowed Mr. Duckers a couple questions beyond his cross-examination time. I allowed Mr. Irigonagare several questions past his, just so you understand how the format works and why I shut him off. His time had expired several minutes before. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, We've got the questions all collected now, is that correct? Excellent. What we're gonna do is we're going to go to our closing statements. Uh, Mr. Duckers will present his closing statement first. You have five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Lacey, Mr. Irigana-Garay, members of the audience. We live in interesting times, times that some future historians may well describe as the era of self-flagellating hubris. On the self-flagellating hand, we are told every day in almost every way that man and mankind are some combination of evil and dumb, but mostly dumb. We burn the wrong things to generate energy. We eat the wrong food. We generate, uh, we, we generate the wrong chemicals. We really can't seem, we, we use the wrong forms of transportation. You know, what, we really, what we've done is when choices had to be made, we've chosen that which is economical, efficient, and convenient. And we really should have been choosing that which is uneconomical, inefficient, and inconvenient because that's what cap and trade is all about. We should be living in one-room huts like we did in the 1850s, riding our bicycles to work, wearing hemp shirts, and eating only that which we can grow in our own backyards. And then you have the hubris the extreme mind-boggling arrogance to think that man, who can't seem to get anything right, can somehow determine the, per the precise correct temperature on a planet that has existed for four and a half billion years, and that with a stroke of a pen in Washington, D.C., we have the ability to control that climate for the next century. It is not the sun, it is not the mighty oceans, it is the pen in Washington, D.C. that signs cap and trade legislation that will determine what your climate is in the year 2100. But to state the proposition, you might, it, it is such a bipolar juxtaposition of wildly inconsistent thought processes that it leads one to the conclusion that tonight we did not need geologists, geographers, economists, and lawyers. What we really needed in this debate was a psychotherapist. Now, I want to switch the order of the issues that we've talked about because I think the, the debate tonight was decided in the testimony of Mr. McKenzie, which stands unrebutted in the record of this case. And that is the testimony that says a cap and trade bill in the United States will do nothing, will do nothing to prevent global warming if, in fact, man made global warming is real. And that, ladies and gentlemen, ends this debate because you can't very well do a cost-benefit analysis when there ain't no benefit to what you're doing. Doesn't matter what it costs, who it pays, we're not getting any benefit. Now, the argument is usually made by the advocates for cap and trade that, oh, we need to do this to lead the way and then China and India will follow. There's a response to that. It's a, it's a Latin phrase, old legal Latin phrase, and it is, give me a break. I mean, we didn't just fall off a turnip trunk here. There is no objective evidence in what's happened in the last 15 years 
to suggest that China and India are going to follow our lead on cap and trade. We emit five times as much carbon per capita as China, even though they are now the largest emitter, emitter and growing by leaps and bounds. And for us to go to them and say, you must match us, is like going to them and saying, well, we just cut off our little finger, and in exchange for that, would you please cut off your arm? They're not going to do it. So we're talking about a unilateral reduction in carbon, which will wreck our economy, increase the price of energy, increase the price of everything you buy, because energy is, in, is incorporated in it, to accomplish absolutely nothing in some sort of foolhardy belief that the Chinese will follow us. So why are we doing this? I don't have the slightest idea, but I'll tell you one reason we aren't doing it, and it's the reason you're almost always given. The ghosts of 9-11 are invoked and you're told this is a national security issue. We have to wean ourselves off Middle Eastern oil by enacting a cap and trade program. Well, that's a lie. And the evidence that that's a lie was given to you tonight in the testimony of Mr. McKinsey. We don't burn crude oil to generate electricity. Cap and trade is all about electricity and about emissions from companies that burn natural gas and coal. If anything, ExxonMobil stands to benefit mightily from a cap and trade proposal because, guess what, folks? They produce a lot of natural gas. And cap and trade is going to shift electrical production to natural gas. This isn't about big oil. And this isn't about the Middle East. This is about some sort of income redistribution scheme that includes money going from the United States to the rest of the world without question and jobs going from the United States to the rest of the world while there's income redistribution going on within the United States. Because as the professor of economics alluded to in his own testimony, we know what's going to happen here. You folks are going to pay the bill. The federal government's going to take a chunk out of it and decide that someone more deserving needs a piece of it to pay those higher electric bills that were brought about by cap and trade. Does it, you know, the, the, I've run out of time. The debate on global warming will stand on its own. But you don't need to reach it, my friends. You never need to reach it because this bill has no benefit, it will do nothing, it will cost a fortune. Reject it out of hand, just as you did my business proposition at the opening statement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Duckers. Mr. Uragana Garay. I don't have the leisure of time to try to be cute about this. Tobacco still kills five million people a year in the world. 45 million Americans continue to smoke because of the misinformation of the tobacco industry. Exxon and other large corporations have a direct financial interest in the outcome of this debate. Exxon has given over $2 million to the Center Enterprise Institute to promote bad science about global warming. Exxon, in 2005, placed into the atmosphere out of their own uh, products 1,047 million metric tons <coughs> of carbon dioxide. Think about that. If you take a look at the nations of the world and the amount of pollution of CO2 that they produced, Exxon would be the sixth. First, the United States with six gigatons. Next, China, 4.75 gigatons. And unlike what my opponent said about we being the only ones interested in developing clean energy, China has recently invested $20 billion to clean up their own air, recognizing the health hazards to their people. Because this isn't just about money. We've got to understand that there are consequences to your children and your children's children, their health, our environment, our crops, poor people in coastal areas that will be displaced by millions because the National Science Academy suggests that at the rate of continued CO2 pollution, ocean levels could rise by five feet by the end of this century. This isn't a matter of whether or not global warming exists. The science has proven that. 
We cannot be fooled again. We cannot be led to believe that these giant companies don't have a financial interest. What's the financial interest of someone like Dr. Fetterman or someone like Dr. Erdhardt or all of these scientists from American National Academies and 11 national and international organizations that are monitoring CO2? Are the Japanese lying about it? Are the French, the Italians, the South Koreans? Is it a world conspiracy when in fact we shouldn't be concerned? <clears throat> Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere today at over 380 parts per million is the highest it has been in over 800,000 years. The National Academy of Science concluded that 2009 was the warmest year in recorded history. Now, one year does not make climate change a reality as Dr. Fetterman said, but when we look at the totality, not an isolated event, not a specific piece of data, but when we do an analysis, as legitimate science has done, we recognize that global warming is a reality. Look, we're not out to save the world. The world is going to be fine without us but we are concerned about the future of humanity. This little ball in which we live in, which came about about four and a half billion years ago and will disappear in about another four billion when the sun expands and consumes it with immense heat. We're not gonna be there. Extinctions occur all the time, but while we are here, while we exist in this planet, we ought to do everything we can to leave it perhaps just a little better than we found it before. Just a little better, a little healthier. What value, what price do you put on health? Asthma and other related issues in Russia right now with the fires. Pakistan. Go out and read. Become involved, be proactive, don't be fooled again. Thank you, Mr. Ghana Garay. Now for our audience questions, uh, I've called my expert witness, my associate director, Dr. Barbara Ballard. Mm -hmm. She is going to read four of the questions that uh, were posed by the audience, so bear with us. We are going, each question will be posed to one of the two teams. That team will have two minutes to respond, and then the other team will have two minutes to respond. Barbara? I hope I have what's negative and what's positive here because we're not sure, but I'll start with what I believe to be uh, affirmative. Uh, why do, uh, this is from Joe Spies, I hope I have his right name, from Overland Park, Kansas. Why do conservatives continue to misrepresent the MIT study on cap and trade, claiming it will increase electric bills, $3,000, when the study's author has made clear that number is 10 times as likely an increase? I hope I'm reading that correct. Would you repeat the question, please? Why do conservatives continue to misrepresent the MIT study on cap and trade electric bills $3,000, when the study's author has made clear that number is 10 times, I want to say, as, li as likely an increase? With okay, thank you. I think I'll, I'll try to answer that very briefly. I don't, I don't know that we certainly didn't cite the MIT study. I'm not frankly sure which MIT study you're referring to. <coughs> John Wise, there, there are a lot of numbers that float around out there, and it varies with the cap and trade proposal that's in mind. The number I'm most familiar with is the, Heri the one the Heritage Foundation testified to uh, before Congress. That may be the MIT number. 
Um, John testified to the fact that the CBO number that people love to throw around doesn't, doesn't, de doesn't address the question at all. It's just talking about whether it's, what its revenue effects on the government are from a taxing and spending perspective, whereas Heritage and MIT and others have attempted to measure what's the consumer impact going to be. Um, and that, that just varies with the proposal. For example, in, in, in the Obama administration memo that I uh, quoted on cross-examination, that, that memo assumed that uh, the cap allowances were going to be sold, and the author of it said it's going to generate $200 billion a year for the federal government in revenues. Now that is a 15% across the board income tax increase from selling those allowances. The, o the only thing that I would say as the negative of this proposition is uh, cap and trade is going to increase costs, uh, and you don't need an expert to tell you that. I mean, you know that if it co costs five times as much to generate the electricity you buy from your utility, you know who's paying for it. Uh, you are, and so then it just becomes a question of what assumptions you make to come up with a number. With a number. If I understand the question correctly, the $3,000 figure is too high, which is why the conservatives misrepresent. Okay, fair enough. Um, it's certainly true that, as the negative team points out, it'll a cap and trade program will raise the cost of electricity, but that's what we want because that's the effective way of inducing change. Um, we're trying to alter the ways in which we make decisions. The negative team's advocate noted that in the past we have chosen, we should, we've chosen efficient options and that our team, the affirmative team, is highlighting inefficient choices. It's only if we ignore the cost to the environment that that makes sense. Um, it's a way of, we're trying to take costs that are a burden on somebody else, and I might add a burden on our children and our grandchildren, we're trying to reduce that burden and, and incorporate it into our decision-making process. So it's only an equitable thing to do to alter our behavior. Um, also, to talk about the cost without referencing the benefits is like the sound of one hand clapping. It, it tells us nothing. So before we start touting about how high the costs are, it'd be lovely to hear more about how large the benefits of this program would be. Second question for the affirmative team. Please feel free to correct if I don't have it. Uh, this question comes from John Sobach, and he's from Lawrence, Kansas. What accounts for the geological warming and cooling environment by the varying layers of stand, sandstone and limestone on ISO? Pardon me? On I-70. On I-70. Could you repeat that, please? Yes. Sorry. The cooling layers of the sandstone? What accounts for the geological warming and cooling environment by the varying layers of sandstone and limestone on I-70? Okay. I only read the question. I'm not an expert on sandstones and I-70, and I'll be the first to admit it. Um, but those sandstones were laid there a long time ago, 90 million years or longer. And basically, that was the bottom of the sea at one point in time, which is kind of an interesting prospect, because we were on the bottom of the sea, too. And at that time, there was an co ocean current flowing from the east to the west, right between Africa and Europe, all the way through along America, up, well, really out into the Pacific, but there was a branch up through the United States. So we laid down lots of layers of rock at that time. There may have been older layers. And during that time, there were significant climate changes, uh, partly because of the amount of carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere, which would have been regulated by plate tonics as plates move. The faster they move, the more CO2 actually get, dives under the plate, and so more comes out of volcanoes. And so we get a slow, very slow accumulation of CO2 warming. And eventually, if there are more collisions, weathering of rock actually will take CO2 out of the atmosphere. So that's one thing that could have been responsible. But we also had fluctuations in solar activity. We still do today. By natural forcings, as we call them, the sun, and um, also volcanic events, for example, right now we should be cooling, because the sun actually has gotten less powerful the last 40 years. But we're warming, OK? So we've actually got a disconnect between the solar cycle, which he suggested was very closely linked to 
temperatures. That's been true for most of the Earth's history. But there have been other things and events, like greenhouse effects, like feedbacks on ice sheets that keep growing. So we get an ice, ice earth in the past. We've had very warm periods uh, because of the way ocean circulation ran. So there are a multitude of factors that create the climate. And understanding each of those and how they influence each other really is what's critical to understanding what's going on. In terms of today, we know that there has been big changes in CO2 in the last 100 years. And those are the changes, really, that we should be concerned with. This is our lives now. Okay, and our children in the future. Uh, and that's in the next few years. All right. The, the, what you see along I-70 are cycles of sedimentation and erosion that took place because of glaciation during the Pennsylvania period. Glaciers came and went, and when the glaciers were extant, then you had lowered sea levels and erosion. And when the glaciers melted, then you had sea levels rising, and you had the sands, the shales, and then the cyclical limestones. That's the short answer. The, the longer answer is that uh, what drives climate is a series of, of uh, dynamic intervals that really are time intensity related. That the, the largest climate cycle change is that of the fact we have an Earth with an envelope of greenhouse gases in an atmosphere. But when you get down to uh, a second order climate change, it is the distribution of continents and oceans. And then on a shorter time scale, the world's oceans really determine what a lot of climate happens. Uh, certainly, the, they're the the water that stores the heat. And then you get down to very tiny things that can, you know, a meteorite impact will change climate for a few years. It's almost like weather, not climate. Uh, human impacts are a minor part of uh, climate change. Uh, certainly, uh, if you have big volcanic episodes, you have the big meteorite impacts, those will change, but those are short term. So you have orders of magnitude. What you see on I-70 was what I would call a, a, a second or third order magnitude. Question, and the negative side will respond to it first. Uh, question is from Jim Mullins from Lawrence, Kansas. Do you think possible change, do you think the possible change in the magnetic North Pole could be a factor in the current global warming? Uh, the answer to that, uh, I really don't know. The only thing we do know is that there are reversals of magnetic poles that occur through geologic time. And one of the fears is that if we are getting ready for another change of magnetic poles, swapping north and south, we have no idea what that would mean. Uh, this is, we, we, like he says, there are these reversals. and. They can be problematic potentially because our electromagnetic field will stop for a bit while we reverse. And so all our, all our digital, and because it actually helps us date a lot of things, and it's been a very useful tool to understand past climates, actually. So although I don't think that's the case, I would like to, to emphasize one thing. He suggested that the envelope, the atmosphere, is the important thing. And I'd like you to think about the CO2 question for a second. Imagine we had 270 parts per million, actually 170 at the last ice age, 18,000 years ago. Imagine that as two drops of dye in your fish tank. Then we added one drop by the time pre-industrialization came, and now we've added another drop since that time, in the last century. Would you see the effect of four drops of dye in a fish tank? Very dark dye. Yes, you would. What is it doing? It's blocking the light. That's what CO2 is doing. If you could see the CO2, and if you could see radiation, you would be doing something right this minute. The problem we're having is we can't see it. You would be seeing huge black clouds coming out of everything if we could, see, we could not see through CO2. And we would probably respond. So I want you to think about it in that way. Just because it's an invisible problem doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Here, our fourth and final question will come from Nick Sambaluk from Lawrence, Kansas. He says, hypothesizing a cap and trade program, at what emissions level should the program be ultimately 
directed? And how could a program be established and guaranteed so that Congress would not cancel it if and when the public might balk at the involved energy cost increases? We'll start with the affirmative side. So the first question is what should the cap be? Uh, the, actually, the beauty of the cap and trade is, honestly, it doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever cap or level is chosen, cap and trade itself is highly effective to use the term that was actually cap, uh, was guiding our discourse tonight. Um, the actual amount would depend upon some balancing of the benefits of the program and the cost to society, not just consumers, but to society. Uh, Honestly, I, I would tell you there's many people who, who disagree on that point. There's um, knights of the royal table in England who, I mean, who will have different uh, points of what would be the accurate emissions level. So I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to weigh in on what exactly that should be. But honestly, the more interesting question is how it should be established so it can be guaranteed so into the future, into the centuries that it'll need to be in place, that it can be uh, intact. Um, that's a pretty tricky one. I mean, we, we are clearly making a sacrifice for our children and grandchildren. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, but we've actually been pretty good at that. I mean, Tom Brokaw spoke of the greatest generation. I mean, that's what they did. People in the Depression and World War II sacrificed so future generations could be better off. Um, it'd be nice if we can invoke that spirit again. How we actually guarantee that um, I mean, that's the grand question of any society. I might add, our brains are really not a, adept at doing that. I mean, keep in mind that for most of our existence on this planet, we have lived very short and brutish lives. We're not designed to handle problems that demand centuries of implementation. We're very good at going out and gathering nuts and berries and stalking down wild animals so that we can make it past 28. So, thank you. If the question is, how do we make sure that Congress doesn't mess something up in the future, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, in California, there's a, one really good example. With, with the Waxman-Markey bill, which is, is our kind of our model for looking at this point, one of the things they're doing is, is what he uh, alludes to, and that is that we're, we're making a decision that's going to take, in the case of the Waxman-Markey bill, 40 years to achieve the, the actual goal. In 2050 is when we're supposed to have about 80 percent reduction in carbon from the selected group of carbon emitters that the Waxman-Markey bill tackles. And so, of course, the problem is what happens in 10 years if, uh, for whatever reason, the, the, the willpower for following through on that is no longer there, and they stop funding it, cancel it, and move on. Uh, of course, the, and I know what they would say is, hey, they won't be because things will be worse, and so it'll be even more relevant. But the other position is they, they won't be worse, and so the political willpower won't be there. I can tell you in California, we're having something very interesting happening this year. They've been striving to implement a renewable electricity standard for 10 years now. The goal was to achieve 20 percent renewable electricity by next year. And California has struggled to get close to that number. In fact, we barely moved uh, about a percent or two when we needed to move about 11 percent. So there is a referendum on the ballot in California this year to suspend that until unemployment uh, drops below 5 percent. And, uh, and that's being put to the voters of California to decide through the referendum which California Constitution provides for. And that's a great example of how a short term of time can cause uh, the short term memories of humans to forget and to suddenly reverse themselves the other way. Of course, the real test will be how the voters vote. And, and I'll finish with the simple fact that the, the battle lines over that one are really interesting because they pit essentially big oil on one side of the funding of the initiative and uh, environmental advocates on the other side. So it's become a, a little test case, and you should watch the election results in November to see what happens. You've had the opportunity to hear both sides extraordinarily well presented. Please join me in thanking our advocates and their expert witnesses. Secondly, uh, we need your feedback tonight. Uh, if you like this program, you want us to do one of these a semester, which is my inclination, uh, please let us know. Send us emails, 
uh, to our website or to us individually or grab us tonight and say that. But give us your feedback on the program because we like this format because it allows us to really illustrate, as I noted, the mission of the Dole Institute and also present very good arguments for both sides. My final thing is to uh, hope that you'll join us for Chairman Jim Leach and his National Civility Tour on September 13th. Have a great evening. Thank you very much for coming out tonight.